Hi everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here again, and this time we're going to be talking about the environmental effects on phenotype. Now I know that classically we think of genotype leading to phenotype, but the reality is, is that phenotypes are a result of both the genes of an individual and the environmental effects. So we're going to look at a lot of specific examples of how environments can shape phenotypes. So let's get to it. So one of the things to think about is that the same genotype can result in multiple phenotypes under different environmental conditions. And so there are instances where there's really no plasticity. You have some specific traits. Those traits are just determine what they are. So I was thinking about this in terms of uh, seeds, for example, and what I was thinking about looking at a collection of seeds where some of them were white and some of them were brown and some of them were black. And the reality is, is that the genes determined the pigments that were released on those particular seeds and they just led to them. Now, the other thing that I was thinking about is that for certain types of species of seeds, they actually undergo some different types of shifts depending on how much uh, maybe moisture is around or environment is around. And so there is actually a little bit of variation in those different traits. And at times, like the, the brown and the black may actually look similar depending on the environmental conditions uh, because under certain conditions, uh, there's a really profound difference. But if you were to find brown from one condition and black from another condition, there's you'll notice that there's an overlap here if I was to draw a line straight across. And so there's some mild plasticity that could make it confusing uh, to see them. And then there's other traits where it's highly plastic and you might not know at all what the genes were involved with this. And so certain forms of pigmentation may be involved there, but if you were to change the environmental conditions, what might under one set of conditions produce one type of trait, if you were to rapidly change there, you actually wouldn't be able to tell what the underlying gene was that led to that because under different conditions, it will look vastly different. And I'm gonna show you some examples that you can get some high plasticity, but we turn plasticity in these terms. So we're really gonna be focusing in on those middle and right hand side graphs in the examples that we talk about today. All right, let's look at some of those examples. So the environmental factors that influence gene expression can lead to, again, that phenotypic plasticity. And phenotypic plasticity occurs when individuals of the same genotype exhibit different phenotypes in different environments. So what that means is that we might have a genotype that would say, oh, based off of this genotype, we think that the protein that's gonna be produced is gonna be green. But if that green pigment is expressed in a different environment, it might not look green, it might look yellow, or it might even look blue, or it might look totally different. And so if something has phenotypic plasticity, what that means is that if we were to change the environmental conditions, we could actually change the ultimate phenotype that is going to be expressed. So what are some of the things that we think about? Well, the, the big five that we have here are the availability of nutrition. So obviously if you have uh, two individuals and one is provided adequate nutrition and one is provided inadequate nutrition, those that provide inadequate nutrition may not reach sort of the genetic potential and so there will be a difference in their um, size as a result of that. Environmental pH, and so there's some very specific pH examples where you can see phenotypes differing based off of the pH of the environment. Temperature, I'll talk about one very prominent one there, uh, UV light. And we know this from our own skin tone that if your skin tone is exposed to UV light, you're going to have different degrees of uh, melanin darkening depending on your original skin type. And that on your own arm, you could have tan lines where you would have one color skin in one part of your body and another um, in another part of your body. Um, I know that I get the classic farmer's tan every summer where the upper portion of my arm is much, much lighter than the lower part of my arm just from naturally being out in the sun and getting UV exposure to different parts of my skin. We also know that chemical signals from other organisms can play a role. All right, so let's look at each one of these as specific examples. So height in humans. So for example, we know that height and weight in humans, there are average heights and average weights that we see here. And we know that if you are undernourished during certain critical times during development, you are not going to reach necessarily the genetic potential how tall you could possibly become, particularly during development. So if you are malnourished, not getting uh, some key elements, some key nutrients in early development, you may not grow to the same height that you would have had you had every available nutrient that you needed during that development. Conversely, if you get too much, you may have some... Uh, impacts to your phenotype as well. 
We also know that uh, pH can express in different phenotypes. The most prominent example of that we have are with hydrangea flowers. If you plant hydrangeas in very acidic soils, they tend to look blue. They have a purplish color if they're in the more neutral 5.5 to 6.5 pH. And if you were to put them in neutral to basic pHs, they actually appear pink. We also know that seasonal fur color in Antarctic animals is an illustration of temperature. This is one of our two temperature examples. And we know that snowshoe hares in particular, they live in mountain ranges in North America. They have the capacity to grow and shed their coats in seasonal change. These hair will grow a nearly pure white coat during winter months. So we can see the far left pure white coat in the surroundings that helps them avoid predators. And then the snowshoe hare starts to shed that winter coat and starts to become darker as climate warms. And so what we end up seeing is that in the middle, you can see that this is an area where the snow is starting to recede. And you'll actually start to see that there's been a loss a little bit of that white. And that hair is actually starting to look almost like a dirty white there. And then on the um, right hand side, we see a fully summer hair that's the snowshoe hair in the summer, not having any of that white hair, having lost all of that winter coat. Now, we also know another example of temperature determination is in reptiles. And what we know from this is that there is a series of sex hormones that occur during development, and the production of some of those hormones is impacted by temperature of the embryo. So we refer to this as non-genetic sex determination, and it occurs when the sex of an organism can be altered during sensitive periods of development, so specific windows of time during egg development with factors such as temperature, but also some humidity. And they also talk about social interactions, which means there could be a chemical signal re released by some members of the species and not by others, and is a widespread process of sex de determination amongst specifically reptiles. We, all, we know that all crocodiles or crocodilians, uh, most turtles and many fish, some lizards, all show this temperature dependent sex determination where specifically in this diagram up here, they're showing that um, at lower temperatures, we get all females. And as you raise up, you get into genetics taking over, but then you go to much higher temperatures and you'll see all males. You, you'll see that this is actually varies what the sex of the offspring are, species to species, and also during what time of development these occur. There are actually um, some cases where high temperatures could lead to all female offspring. You could also have instances where high temperatures could lead to all male offspring. The diagram here makes signifies that it would be all males at high temperatures, but I will say that it actually varies um, both at the timing uh, of when the temperature change occurs, but also what species you're talking about. All right, another effective example we talk about is the effect of increased UV light on melanin production in animals. And so we can see an arm here. And again, this is the example I mentioned earlier where the upper arm here has very low UV exposure. And as we, as a result, you can see it's a lighter skin tone. But as you move down the arm here, you're seeing increased UV exposure and you see increased melanin production in here. Uh, so this is again a type of plasticity leading to different phenotypes. Now, another example is the presence of opposite mating types or pheromones produced by yeast or other fungi. And so what we know from this is that in certain types of fungi, there are multiple different types of haploid existing strains, if you will, that could exist in a given environment. And they will put out mating hormones at certain times. And if two opposite mating times are within close proximity and they send out their hormones, it will spark them to come together, fuse, produce a, a diploid reproductive structure, undergo meiosis, put out spores, and mate. Now, this is an example of the only thing that leads to the behavior is the presence of that opposite mating hormone. If you have a yeast cell or this type of fungi cell in an environment, even if it's putting out these hormones, if it's not receiving the signal from the other mating type, it will not initiate a phenotypic change that would ultimately lead to reproduction. So again, this is sort of subtle in terms of phenotype, but the, the physical structures that you would see in these organisms, they look quite different during mating than they do when non-mating. And so this is a case where the phenotype will have a distinct shift if the presence of an opposite mating type is present. All right, so that was really a, a host of different illustrative examples of how phenotype can change depending on environmental exposure. I hope that was helpful, and I'll talk to everybody soon.